So good afternoon. Uh, I'm your chair for this session, which is one of the action workshops. And I will shortly be have, passing you across to Dr. Laurent Favain, who works uh, with me as part of the team on Impact Lab for the University of Plymouth. So I thought very briefly, just for one moment, I'll give you a little bit of background about me and Impact Lab, and then I'll hand across to Laurent to do her session for us this afternoon. So Impact Lab is a uh, ERDF funded project set up to support Devon based SMEs, uh, enabling them access to university academic skills and expertise and facilities free of charge. And Laurent works with me in that project supporting, uh, well, to date we've got about 47 different businesses we work with locally. Um, and several of those have been really interested in life cycle assessments. And it appears to be a topic that is growing in interest. So we thought it would be useful to do a session this afternoon on that. And Luann will go into more detail, but she has extensive background um, in undertaking life cycle assessments. So we have set up a poll, which I'm hoping you'll see on your right hand side of your screen. I'm just going to launch that now. So that should come up fairly soon. Um, so if you could just let us know if you have undertaken life cycle assessment before whether it be for a product, a service, a business, any idea you're doing. Um, it would just be interesting to know from the audience participation how many people have and how many people. Um, so I shall now pass you across um, to Loan, and um, she can start the presentation this afternoon. Good afternoon, Loan. Good afternoon. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to just share my screen with you so you can see my presentation. So, so far, we've got 83% 80, of people have not undertaken a life cycle assessment before, and 16% have. So, just for information there, Luan. And I can see your presentation, so I'll now remove, remove myself from the screen and I'll let you take over. Right. Thank you. Uh, so, this afternoon, I'm going to give you an overview of uh, what's called a cradle to cradle analysis with life cycle assessment. Um, so... Um, to briefly outline uh, what I'm going to say, I'm going to try and explain what life cycle assessment is uh, and try to show you why you could carry a life cycle assessment. Um, and finally, I'm going to go through uh, details about how to carry a life cycle assessment. Uh, I will not discuss, discuss all the assumptions I make, but give you an idea of the sort of process and results you can expect by doing a life cycle assessment. Uh, and to do that, I'm going to walk you through uh, the comparison of two processes. So the making of a plastic bottle using uh, polyethylene turf phthalate, which is recycled, or uh, bio-based plastic. Okay, so first thing first, what is life cycle assessment? Well, according to the ISO standard uh, definition, this is a compilation and evaluation of all the inputs, outputs, and potential environmental impact of a product system throughout its life cycle. Well, looks a bit scary, but it's basically a way to assess, assess the resource use in energy, water, material, land, and account for all the pollutants and global warming potential for products. So here you can see at the bottom uh, image, well, it, it, it takes into account the material, the manufacturing, the distribution, the use, and end of life if you wanted to. So usually you do that uh, by the use of, um, of a software that requires huge database and a dedicated calculation method. So I'm going to explain a bit more about that. So the concept of life cycle assessment uh, started in the 60s, 1960s, for those of you who are young enough, um, and it's due to uh, concern regarding the limitation access uh, to energy and materials. So in the 70s, Ecoblance and uh, uh, the re resource and environmental profile analysis were started both in Europe and in the US, and they are all aiming at being a quantitative approach to assess the impact of a product or a system on the environment. Well, they require huge databases. So uh, on the right hand side, you have uh, a few of them that are represented. They can be produced by entities such as the European Commission or company. For instance, the EcoInvent database, which is the one I'm going to use for this presentation. 
and it's the world's largest transparent life cycle assessment database available. Uh, you have to pay for it. Um, and you use dedicated multi-factor calculation method uh, that have been developed throughout the years by various institutions across the world. Uh, to do that, you use a tool, a software. So uh, on the bottom here of this slide, you can see a few of them. Uh, and I'm going to use today CIMAPRO. So I talked earlier about database being a key uh, in conducting a life cycle assessment. Why? Because they refer every single process and detail you want to use. So here you can see an example, an extract of um, the, the documentation regarding one process that you could have in your processes, which is the uh, production of activated carbon from hard coal. So as you can see, the documentation provides you every detail regarding the input, output, whatever they are, the quantity of them, where the data come from, and all the reference. So it's very detailed. The total for this carbon, uh, activated carbon production uh, is literally 14 pages. So it's pretty detailed. Right. So now I'm going to um, try and convince you of why you should carry uh, a life cycle assessment. Well, um, it's a very useful if you want to identify critical hotspots in your process or in your production system, if you want to optimize the environmental performance. Um, so and globally, if you want to design a new product or a new, proce uh, new processing, uh, it's also an interesting um, tool to be more sustainable. Uh, should you want to reduce the risk in your supply chain when you want to purchase some raw material, it's also uh, interesting to identify rare raw materials. Uh, you can use it also to do policy making or if you want to do some eco labeling or marketing of products in a more environmentally conscious society. Well, it might be interesting to know that among the multinational companies, uh, Unilever, IKEA, Nestle, and many others are using life cycle assessment uh, in order to increase the sustainability of their activity. So to give you a more Let's say a practical example. Let's say you want to ev evaluate um, a new product that you're developing, uh, which is a wrap. So you want to use paper or plastic. Well, how do you make the decision? Which raw material will be the best? We use less resource and produce less uh, pollution. Which product design would be the best? And which have to use process should you consider for your product? Well, that's all question you can answer using life cycle assessment. So now let me try and explain how you, you can carry a life cycle assessment. Well, you have basically four big steps. So first you define the goal and scope, then you proceed to the life cycle inventory analysis, then the life cycle assessment, and you can interpret your results. So I'm gonna walk you through those steps. So first you define your goal. So it's clearly what are the uh, application you want to to do with this product and the reason to carry out the study and which is the intended audience. Well, let's say for instance, you want to determine the more sustainable paint for you to repaint a wall. Um, then you define the function. Um, so it depends obviously on the goal and scope and you, depend, you define the functional unit, which is the, the quantity of every specific function you want to use in your product. So here the main function is painting a wall and the functional unit will be the surface of wall that you want to paint. So in this example, a square meter. It allows you to make all the results comparable. So once you've done that, you want to um, create the reference flow so it's basically the output of processes that you need to fulfill your function. Well, more clearly, let's say you want to paint one square meter of wall. Yeah. So the question is, which amount of water-based paint would you require for it? And which amount of solvent-based paint would you re require? So as you can see, it's different depending on the paint you want to use. So that's your reference flow. <clears throat> then you want to define the system boundaries. 
So you can do that in different ways. So as I said, initially, it's thought about as a cradle to grave or cradle to cradle sort of um, analysis. So you can encounter the resources, the manufacturer, the use phase, the disposal, and all the emissions. You can also uh, choose to do a more um, restrained study uh, and, for instance, focus on one process, which is called gate to gate, or from resource to gate, which is called cradle to gate, or just from the use to the final disposal of the product. Um, so that's really up to you, and it depends on your need. Uh, so, it, for instance, here is the system is is a system of a life cycle corn-based polylactic acid plastic film. So you you have to grow some corn first, and then you transform them into polylactic acid using chemical process, and then you can extrude some uh, the the plastic and so and so on and so on. Well, the idea is that here you can you can basically uh, cut the system into small pieces and choose which one is in and which one would be out of your consideration. Um, so now that um, we've seen what sort of, uh, of goal and scope we can face, I'm going to discuss the life cycle inventory analysis. Uh, so it's basically now that you know what what sort of system globally you're going to use, you want to see into more details. So you want to compile and quantify everything that's going to go into your process. So for that, you need to collect data, um, especially if you're developing a new process. Well, that would be for you to know exactly what materials are coming in and what emissions are coming out. So material, resources, energy, and all the emission waste and maybe some co-product. So that, that will go into the inventory. Um, so again, it's important here to visualize each single process and their location on Earth and to try and know to the best of your ability where the material come from, processing, where the processing is done, uh, where are the customers. So if you're using an already made database, uh, those information will be sort of pre-existing. So it's like you're making assumption on those things. So it's, it's also important to check the database you're using and the documentation to try and understand better um, exactly what you're talking about. You don't want to, if you are using, for instance, electricity in your process, it's very important to know where it's been made because depending on your location on Earth or even in, in Europe, um, it's it's very different. It can be choked coal that's that's used to make it or it can be nuclear so it's uh yeah it can really have an impact on the end result so now that you've sketched every step of your life cycle you you can put your input and output for each of them and we can now go to the life cycle impact assessment right so just as a summary um on the real case that we're considering here, which is the plastic bottle, before I move into the next step. So um, I'm gonna use uh, CIMAPRO and the Incon event database. So in our case, the goal would be for a soda company who would want to know whether to use bioplastic, bio-based plastic, so made of uh, some starchy product like a potato, um, or uh, recycled PET plastic for a new bottle. PET is very commonly used for plastic production for food products. So that's why I use that as an example. Uh, and the scope would be the production and transportation of a thousand of the plastic bottle uh, towards the soda factory. So the system already are cradle to gate in this case, and I'm gonna consider all the impact. So I'm going to discuss the impact now and what what impact category. Um, yeah, that that's going to come slightly later. So in in Simapo in a software, here is how it looks like. Yeah, uh, obviously this is a workshop, but it would be very difficult to give you access to Simapo to all of you. So uh, I'm going to show you from time to time a screenshot 
that I took when I carried the analysis so you can get an idea of how it looks like in the real world. So here, basically, I created a project, named it, and I assessed my goal. Like You can give the reason why you're doing the, the lifecycle assessment, who commissioned it, who can be the interested party. So you can, you can write a lot. Right, so that's your golden scope definition into the software. So now let me walk you a bit more into the scenario that I'm considering. So the steps of the of the product. So that's scenario one. So in this case, I'm using a starch-based polylactic acid uh, bottle. So first you make the granulate, then you want to do a stretch blue molding to make your bottle and this, those bottles are going to be transported to the to the soda factory uh, using a container ship over 350 uh, no 3500 kilometers sorry so that's your first scenario here we're not considering the use or the end of life of the product they are considered out of scope literally so in the second scenario, we're using a recycled PET bottle grade granulate. So this is the raw material. Uh, the manufacturing is going to be the same as um, the previous uh, scenario. So low stretch molding. And the transportation is going to be by aircraft over the same distance. So, so you're trying to, um, to have comparable scenario as much as possible you it's just yeah your results are more consistent in the end um so what you do in the software to as to account for all the steps is shown in this page so it looks a bit scary right now but it's basically a list of all the process that exists in the database that i've been using so it's just an example i've not put any boric acid in the product but basically you can choose whatever process you want to include as part of your processes, as part of your life cycle. And uh, yeah, and there is normally a description or at least uh, yeah, a, a summarized description of the process or a link to the, um, to the database documentation so you can have a look and understand it better, right? So now that you've done, you, you, you create your process and then you can create the, um, product stages and the life cycle assessment. So here I've created, for instance, the shipping of a plastic bottle by sea. So that's it for one of my scenario, just to show you an, an example of how it's done. Yeah. So when you've done that, you, you want to select um, a calculation uh, method for your uh, analysis. So here I'm using um, the method called recipe. Well, it's the objective of this um, thing is to um, try and transform the results of your life cycle into a limited number of uh, indicator scores because um, you will have lots of emission, lots of output, lots of input, and you want to narrow it down to a few numbers just to make it easier for you to understand your results um, and to share those results. So here is what I'm doing. I'm selecting the method of calculation. And because I'm going to do a comparison between two different scenarios on choosing the function to uh, compare, I could also do a network analysis if I want to study one pro process into more detail. <clears throat> So um, I'm going to now discuss the, the impact category that are considered into a life cycle assessment into more detail. And for each of the impact category that I'm going to talk about, I'm going to try and show you the result for the, the considered scenarios. So I'm not doing the calculation right now because it takes a bit of time, but I'm going to show you the, the result that I've done for those two uh, scenarios, so those two bottles, one which is uh, bio-based plastic and the other one which is made of recycled PET. So 
The impact category can be summarized in three big ones. So global, such as resource depletion, global warming or ozone depletion. Regional, for instance, the land use, if you want to grow some, some palm, for instance, well, you're going to use some land. Uh, and more local impacts, such as uh, human or ecotoxicity, uh, eutrophication, and photochemical oxidant creation. So I'm going to discuss some of those into more detail. I'm not necessarily going to discuss all of them, but I'm going to uh, show you the one that I'm the more relevant for the scenario considered here. Um, well, do not hesitate to let me know if you have uh, questions. <clears throat> so first one is the resource scarcity. So resource can be use of land or the use of fossil resource, for instance, or anything. Well, in that case, we're talking about a plastic bottle, so you will not use any rare earth element. So yeah, that's why I'm focusing on those two. So land use here on the left-hand side uh, plot is showed for the bio-based plastic bottle. And you can see the detail for the three different main process, which is the production of the polylactic uh, granulate, the stretch blow molding into a bottle, and the transport in a container ship. So the unit here is in square meter of crop equivalent per year. So it's basically the surface of land that you're going to use uh, per year to produce those bottles. Uh, it can be interesting because land use can lead you to land use change. So it can have an impact on, well, the forest in everywhere because you, you basically cut them down when you want more land. So it's an important impact on that, uh, on that respect. Well, fossil resource scarcity is the other um, uh, impact category that is important for this uh, scenario comparison. So uh, this is expressed in kilogram of oil, crude oil equivalent. And I'm showing here the comparison between the bio-based plastic bottle and the PET bottle. So for all the steps, so you can see you have the production of the primary material, which is the PET granulate or the polylactic acid granulate. Well, uh, PET, because it's recycled, used a very, very tiny amount of uh, fossil fuel. Uh, stretch, mold, stretch blow molding um, is minor contribution. And uh, if, you con if you compare the two transportation methods, well, the aircraft is the one that's polluting the, the more. But the pollution of polylactic acid granulates is the worst because, well, you need to plant the crops, harvest them, and then transform them. So that's used a lot of uh, resource. Uh, so another, well, big impact, but I think we're all aware of it, is the global warming potential. This can increase the, um, the amount of wildfire and basically uh, increased number of extreme climatic events that can be expected in the future, and so among other terrifying things. So in the scenario considered here, the global warming potential is also considered. So I'm, I'm showing here the, the potential impact for the, for the two scenarios, so the bio-based plastic bottle and the PET bottle. Uh, global warming, when it's characterized like this, is always shown in equivalent of uh, CO2 emission, which is a well-known um, greenhouse gas. So the way you do that is by, you, well, the, you don't do it, the software does it for you, but it, it basically converts any other greenhouse gas emission into its equivalent in CO2. So for instance, if you have one kilogram of methane. Methane is 25 more, uh, has two, 25 more greenhouse effect than CO2. So then you use a multiplying factor of 25 and you have your equivalent in CO2. Yeah. So uh, that's going to be, that's going to be your, your uh, global warming potential expressed here. So Again, the, the, um, the biggest contribution is the polylactic uh, acid granulate production. Uh, and then in second is the stretch blow molding, which appears in both scenario and the transport 
using an aircraft. So yeah, that's, that's your global warming potential here. Uh, next is the acidification potential. You might have heard of it. So it's um, basically when you have um, sulfur or nitrogen oxygen that are being released in the atmosphere, uh, it increases the acidity of the rain and it, it can have a damage, as you can see here on this um, uh, example. <laughs> Sorry, on this example, uh, is, it's a forest in Czech Republic. Um, and so acidification has uh, made it suffer some some significant damage. You can see it on the on the tree themselves. Uh, acidification can also damage marine ecosystem and ecosystems as well as ecosystem on land. In water, the the CO two emission can also have uh, an impact because they, they increase the acidity of the water, and they can. One of the impact is that they can affect the coral reef. So this is just uh, an example here of a study that's been uh, partly done by uh, someone from uh, Plymouth University. Um, well, the acidification potential was not as significant uh, in this uh, scenario. I just wanted to explain it a bit because it, it can be very important. Um, so next would be um, three more sort of local uh, effects. So photochemical ozone creation potential. Uh, so this one is basically the formation of ozone in the low layer of uh, the atmosphere, which is due to the interaction of the sunlight and nitrogen oxide with hydrocarbon and various other compounds. So it creates some smog, basically. And it's irritant to human and can also, among other things, reduce the plant carbon storage capacity. Uh, I think, yeah. The, the, the other one is fine particulate matter formation. So it's just basically small particle that uh, can be harmful to, to the ecosystem and human. So you can also, together with uh, the ozone uh, mentioned earlier, they can um, reduce plant carbon storage capacity and they can be uh, a problem for a respiratory system in various um, beings. Uh, and uh, Last impact is, well, sorry, I should have said that the, the unit for fine particular formation is expressed in terms of um, PM 2.5, so that's the size of them in micron, uh, and ozone is expressed in, uh, in terms of um, nitrogen oxide. And the last effect, uh, toxicity potential, is basically, um, the, uh, the, the damage, so it can be an environmental persistence or the accumulation of, in the human food chain and the, basically the toxicity of um, a process on human and other living forms. So it's expressed in, in a kilogram equivalent of 1,4 dichlorobenzene, which is a toxic <coughs> chemical compound. Um, so, in these two scenarios, the, the, the ones that have uh, the more significant um, effects locally are the toxical potential, uh, the, the human non carcinogenic toxicity, and uh, marine ecotoxicity, so the damage to humans which are not linked to cancer, and the damage to the marine ecosystems. So. Um, they are both expressed in uh, terms of uh, dichlorobenzene uh, equivalent. So that's the DCB here. Um, and on the left-hand side, this is a comparison between the two scenarios. So again, the polylactic acid production is the most harmful, or potentially. Uh, then you have the stretch blow molding of the plastic for the human toxicity, and then the pet granulated uh, recycling, recycling that is also uh, pretty damageable. Uh, regarding the impacts on the marine ecotoxicity, eco um, <clears throat> I'm showing here the example of the recycled PET granulate. And as you can see, the process that can be the more harmful for the marine ecosystems is the, recycl the recycling of the PET granulate. So it can be interesting for you to 
if you want to use that as a raw material, it can be interesting to, to go and look into more details into why and maybe try and improve those aspects. Um, <clears throat> another sort of local um, impact is eutrophication. So it can occur in marine or it can be occur in uh, fresh water. And this is due to the excessive input of phosphorus and nitrogen into water and land uh, from agricultural activities or a combustion process. So for instance, if you use extra fertilizer or you can have other effluent from animal farming, well, this will have an impact on uh, the water. Uh, for instance, here you can see um, an example of a harmful um, algae. Uh, and it can be, well, pretty damageable to the ecosystem themselves because it, it will imbalance the, the amount of nutrients that they get. And so some plants will prosper and some other that also rely on the oxygen that is present in the water might die. Uh, it can also be a problem for people that uh, are trying to exploit the, the water or the, the fish or other things. So it can also have economical impact. Uh, in these two scenarios that uh, we are considering today, uh, the freshwater eutrophication is is the the one that is the more significant. Um, so as you can see, the so I'm showing here the on left hand side the scenario with bio based plastic, and on the other one is recycled PET. Uh, as you can see, um, again polylactic acid production seems to be uh, the more impactful on that respect. And that is probably because when you grow, um, well, whatever start you're using to produce the polylactic acid, you're gonna use fertilizer for your land and, and other products that, that are very likely to be at some point released into the fresh water and therefore it will have an impact. So it can be interesting to, to look into that if you want to use polylactic acid. <clears throat> so, yeah. Uh, when we've, so we know we've characterized those impacts in, in category. So each of them being uh, using a reference substance. So, sorry, I, I forgot to mention that here, the, the reference substance is phosphorus expressed in kilogram of phosphorus equivalent. Um, and so once you've done that step, uh, in order to make your result more comparable and to basically aggregate your, your impact together and see the global impact you're going to have on the environment, it can be interesting to, to move towards um, what's called normalization or weighting. So, now what we've done is the classification by impact category. So we assigned all the output and input um, impact into impact category from global warming to toxicity and uh, others. And so now we can characterize those impacts so you can scale them according to the average impact of a person in continental Europe because well, the, the calculation method I've used has been developed in Europe, but if you're in the US, you can use another method that, that will use the average impact of a person in the US as your sort of uh, scale. And then we can afterwards uh, do some sort of weighting. That's also, again, something that the, method, the calculation method will provide to you. And that will allow you to see the significance of your impact on the environment in, in the category. So, uh, yeah, this this uh, weighting we're going to do it uh, at the very end because, um, yeah, it will it will give a sort of a global perspective on the on the whole um, situation. So the normalized uh, potential impact uh, are expressed, as I mentioned, as the equivalent of one person impact per year in 
every given category. So for instance, if we are talking uh, global um, global warming, well, the the average uh, CO two equivalent impact per European is around seven ton of CO two. So that that will be your reference when you when you you consider the global warming effect of um, any other uh, potential. Yeah. <clears throat> so here um, there is three plots, one showing the local impact that are meaningful in that case. So there are others, but they're not very significant for those two scenarios. Uh, the regional impact and the, glo whoop, the global impact. Sorry about that. Um, right. So locally first, uh, well, those are expressed in person per year equivalent, as I said. Um, and so I'm considering two scenarios, bio-based plastic bottle and PET bottle. And as you can see, the, the biggest impact is going to be the marine ecotoxicity. Uh, it's worse for the bio-based plastic bottle. Uh, then you have the freshwater toxicity, so toxicity to any ecosystem that are in freshwater, like river, lake, and the human carcinogenic toxicity is also uh, quite important. I mean, it, it's five percent of um, uh, one person equivalent per year. Um, so the well, and as you can see. It looks like the bio-based plastic bottle is the one that has, is going to be having a biggest impact on locally, um, which personally I didn't expect. Um, so if you're talking a more regional impact, so you've land use and terrestrial acidification, so that's the acidification of the soil, like this soil on the forest, uh, those are expressed both for the bio-based plastic bottle and for the PET bottle again in person equivalents per year and the one that that is clearly dominating dominating the the impact is the land use because of the production of uh, polylactic acid because you need to grow some crop first and then use some land so it, it if you want to consider this scenario in real life it could be interesting for you as a company to look into the production to see if if you're potentially trying to do some deforestation to grow your crop or not. So that's something you want to keep in mind. Um, so that's for the regional impact. Again, bioplastic bottle has the strongest impact. So more globally, uh, we have uh, the impact on so the global warming potential, the stratospheric ozone depletion, uh, resource scarcity, so water consumption, and fossil resource uh, scarcity. Yeah, so that's the that's the impact uh, that you can expect. So uh, in this case, um, well, global warming is is slightly worse for the PET bottle, and uh, weirdly enough, uh, because the yeah, for the for the polylactic acid, it looks like you're having even a beneficial uh, impact because you're avoiding the consumption of a of a resource. So that's why you see this um, this negative uh, consumption. Though you have more water because probably because of the of the growing of the crop that you use to make the polylactic acid. So yeah, um, in this slide. We see that on average, I mean, most of the impact are bigger for the poly for the bio-based plastic bottle. Um, quite surprisingly for me, at least. So um, uh, now we are gonna um, look into uh, what's called an endpoint assessment, and this is when you you um, try and have the same reference. For um, for the damage you cause, and you, you separate them into three big area, which is the resource use, the impact on human health, and the impact on uh, ecosystems. 
So for this, um, you we're using three different uh, units, and they express all of them in these three different units. And I'm showing here the the damage potential damage on the environment. So for the resource, uh, the human health and the ecosystem, as I mentioned. So in both, I'm going to show the result for both uh, scenario um, in all in the three plots. Yeah. So uh, first is the resource use. So it, it accounts everything. So land use, um, fuel use, Every every resource you use is accounted for in here, and the unit is um, the surplus cost that will cost you if you want to produce the same resource in a year time. If you're considering that you can have a constant annual production, that's that's how much more you will have to pay to extract the same resource. Basically, uh, well, you can see that the one that's having the biggest impact is the polylactic acid. Uh, granulate production uh, and follow is the transport aircraft, which personally I thought would be the worst because you're using an awful amount of fuel to fly an aircraft. But yeah, here we go. So yeah, the more damage is going to potentially be caused by the production of your uh, bio-based plastic. Uh, for human health, well, this is not a very cheery um, unit. Uh, it's DALI, which means Disability Adjusted Life Years. So this is a unit that is taking into account all the year you will lose to premature death and or uh, to, to reduce quality of life due to illness in uh, those years as well. So pretty depressing unit. Uh, again, production of uh, polylactic uh, acid granulate for your bio-based plastic bottle seems to be the more damageable, followed by the, the making of the bottle itself. And then you have the transport aircraft. So again, producing the bio-based plastic is the more damageable. Uh, and lastly is the damage on the ecosystem. So this is expressed in another very cherry um, unit, which is the loss of species over a certain area, uh, over a certain time. So here we're talking in Europe, and the unit is in year. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so again, the, the one that's the more damageable potentially would be the polylactic acid by far compared to any others. And that's probably because if you want to grow any new crop nowadays, you want, you need to cut down some forest, rainforest mostly, and then you are a danger for every living being in this forest. And so that's why you have your potential damage. So finally, um, I'm gonna, th there is a way to express all this damage into one single unit, uh, and they're called the weighted damage. Uh, and so you can, uh, yeah, aggregate them together. So they're expressed in the equivalent of the annual share of the environmental load for European per year. And because this is quite a big unit by itself, we're using um, milli point, which is one over a thousand point. In this, in this case, so for the two scenarios considered, I'm showing here the the weighted damage. Um, so, regarding human health, well, the bio-based plastic bottle is the one with the biggest uh, impact globally, with uh, 150 millipoints. Uh, regarding the ecosystem damage, again. Um, bio-based bio -based plastic bottle is the worst with uh, 400 millipoints and for the resource use they are slightly non-significant because this is a very very low score so overall uh, you can see that the the 
the one that the, the one scenario that is the one that has the more damage on the environment is the production uh, of um, polylactic acid based bottle, which personally I didn't expect, despite the fact that the other bottle is transported by aircraft. So it's interesting, interesting to see that sometimes you're you have some bias against some uh, process and it turned out to be not that bad. Um, but yeah, this this is uh, basically the end result showing that the bio-based plastic bottle is potentially the worst on the environment. So you want to try and see what you can do to improve that if you want to choose this scenario. Um, and so to conclude, well, I hope I showed today that uh, life cycle assessment can be a powerful tool set if you want to obtain uh, quantitative information on the potential impact you can have on, um, on the environment when you develop a product or a system. And also it can help you to manage uh, the supply chain. Uh, it is very versatile because it can take into account all the steps of a product life cycle or just any sub-process you choose. And um, because of the database, which are uh, quite huge, you have lots of process from, I mean, growing potatoes to uh, making a laptop from scratch for it. So it's very complex um, data. Uh, results can sometimes be counterintuitive. Well, in this case, an aircraft flying is is having less impact than growing some uh, some crops and turning them into plastic. Um, again, the data you need to you, the data you're using um, need to be very reliable uh, and to be representative of them because otherwise uh, you can end up with results that don't really have a sense. Uh, so, and for that, you need to have an accurate description of your system and relevant data set to be used. Um, finally, just a small warning, which is that uh, this method, even if it's uh, great and very useful, uh, rely on assumption made on the, on the system itself, its boundaries and the process, where it takes place. So it's, it's always good to take the result with a pinch of salt. Um, because obviously all those assumptions you make can impact uh, the end result. Right, well, I hope I interest you a bit in uh, life cycle assessment. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thanks, Laurent. That's really helpful and nice and clear. We've got a few questions that have come in. Um, I'm hoping you might be able to see them, but if you can't, I can go through them with you anyway. So first off, um, these have come in throughout the talk, so not just at the end, so they might relate to one specific aspect. Um, Elena said, um, who is expected to carry out the life cycle assessment? For example, the sustainability engineer, the architect, the QS or a dedicated LCA consultant. Uh, she said that's specifically in reference to buildings. Um, and then also what educational training background do you need to have to complete a life cycle assessment? Uh, right. So, well, I myself was trained as an environmental engineer and that's where I learned how to use uh, life cycle assessment software, CMAPO, uh, but uh, they, all of them work similarly. So um, if the person you hire as an engineer, an environmental engineer in your company uh, has this sort of training, you can do it for you. Otherwise, yeah, you can hire a life cycle assessment a consultant. Uh, be aware that those software, even if they are great, they don't come uh, for free. And the database, most of the time, also don't come for free. So if you cannot produce your own data, if you don't know your process well enough, uh, it can be interesting to purchase them, but it, they come with a cost. Um, that's something to be aware of. Uh, for construction, uh, there is actually um, a software that that's been dedicated to that. Um, so if if you if you have, if that's something that is of particular interest for you, I can um, yeah, and you can send me an email and uh, I can email you the, the name of this software that's been developed particularly for construction. Okay, um, thank you. 
That's helpful. So I'll move on to the next one, just looking down the screen there. This one's from Samuel. Um, is it customary for a company producing a new sustainable product to perform its own life cycle assessment or have a third party perform them? Um, well, I wish it will become <laughs> customary. Um, it is done now by uh, some big company, like I mentioned, Unilever and Nestle, for instance. Um, they carry them themselves. Uh, other, if you're a smaller company, uh, having to pay for the cost of the software, the database can be a bit heavy for you. So you might want to have that done. For now, it's not mandatory when you make a product to have it. Uh, it well, for some eco labeling, it's it's mandatory to have done the life cycle assessment and to have a third party uh, examining the results. So that for that reason, you might want to do that if you want to have this specific um, eco labeling for your product. Uh, but yeah, so you, you can also carry That's it yourself fine. if you. <laughs> sure. That's fine. Uh, one of our colleagues, John Summerscales, has put in a couple of questions there as well. Um, uh, the important parts are coherent goal and scope and analysis with validated data and an independent audit. So following up from what you just said there, obviously it's hugely beneficial to have an independent aspect to it, if at all possible, throughout the process. As you mentioned, if depending on the size of the business, it might make a difference on their approach to life cycle assessments and, and whether they undertake that themselves or whether they um, outsource it to um, a separate um, separate company. Um, and then also, just scrolling down here, uh, Susie's asked, is the software giving you the equivalent per unit, e.g. pollutant stroke energy values you are measuring for each process, or are you finding those elsewhere? Um, so normally for every process that are in the database that is used by the software you're using, this will be included, but you can also create your own process in the software. Uh, there is a way for you to create um, a process. Well, for instance, in the, the study that I've uh, showed today, I'll create my own process to make the plastic. Um, so you, you can, for that, you can use already existing sub process in the software, or you can really enter it from scratch with all the inputs um, water, land, I mean, you can really create it from scratch. Yeah, that's that's an option. Thank you. Um, also, for information as well shared here, um, the University of Plymouth has 40 available seats for the Simipo software. I know, Loanne, you've recently yeah. got one for yourself, so that's really helpful for you. Um, yes. But if within the University of Plymouth community, if other people are interested, um, please do get in contact because uh, there are possible opportunities for others to have that software available for them to use. Um, and then the, the last one there, um, can you see this as well, Lauren? So it says that impact um, allows construction professionals to measure the embodied carbon, life cycle environment, and life cycle cost performance to buildings. And there's a link there. Um, so I don't know if everybody else can see that, but if they can, we'll try and get that up so people can, can see that as well. Um, so that's all the questions I've got at the moment. We've got a couple of minutes left if anybody else has got any other questions. So I thought, Lorraine, I just I might ask you one myself if that's okay. Yeah. Sure. Um, so we've done some life cycle assessments through the Impact Lab project. Yes. Um, I didn't know if you wanted to not go through them in detail, but just give the context of the different types of businesses you've done a life cycle assessment for so far. Um, yes. Well, um, I've done a life cycle assessment for um, for a plant grower uh, that wanted to do some organic growing, so to, to see the impact of that. And uh, another one has been conducted for a mining uh, company. So that's that's uh, and some well two more small um, assessments have been done for a bamboo. Um, tool company and um, a fabric design company. 
So, so yeah, so they were very different, weren't they? Because I know that the fabric company you mentioned there and the bamboo company are what you classify as small businesses looking at new sustainable products. Yes. So creating something sustainable and understanding the very positive nature of that in itself. Mm. Whereas the previous ones you mentioned with regard to a quarry is entirely different because it's a very, very large scale process that in itself is perhaps not deemed to be particularly sustainable, but understanding actually you've got to have a baseline to move forward from and put into practice yeah. better measures to make the process more sustainable. Is that right? Yeah, yeah definitely. That's, that's a great aspect. Again, if you're a small business and you're watching this, uh, feel free to contact us and we can conduct the basic assessment for you, well, to the best of our abilities, obviously. And I know one of the questions came in from a, um, somebody I was talking to recently. Um, they were actually have been asked to look at a life cycle assessment with regard to funding opportunities. So, you know, as one of the things where previously in the past, people have been asked to submit, you know, um, a quality and diversity strategy or sustainability strategy um, as part of a, a funding request. Uh, one has actually been asked to look at a life cycle assessment as part of the funding request. So it's quite, I think, um, timely that moving forward, this sort of yeah. approach is becoming more and more apparent for being used in a, in a really wide range of things. Um, so I've got another question here. Are you open to inquiries from other SMEs developing new products that would like a life cycle assessment? Yes, we certainly are, Amanda. Um, so if you'd like to get in contact, then we can certainly follow up with you. Um, and that's something that we have been doing, as Lauren said, she's done a take in summer already, um, but we can certainly look at supporting some business locally around life cycle assessments and assisting in, in that process. Um, very much a knowledge exchange aspect, so enabling you to do it yourself, but with some additional support um, rather than just doing it for you. But um, so the longer term as a business, you'd be able to, um, uh, to, to look at it for new products as, as you move forward with, with your businesses. Um, so, Luan, is there anything else you'd like to finish off with? Uh, no, thank you for your time. And uh, again, just uh, if you want a life cycle assessment to be conducted for your business, just uh, get in touch. We're happy to do so. Thank you very much. Um, well, I, I believe on your screens, I can't see it on mine, but I think you can put claps on. So I'm, I'm going to give a round of applause to Rand. Thank you very much. Uh, really informative, very interesting, and uh, really useful this afternoon. Um, and uh, other than that, I think now we will we'll finish this um, live session. Thank you for joining us. And uh, I'm sure some of you will join back to the main, main um, arena for everything else that's going on with the rest of the agenda. Yep. So thank you. Thank you. Bye.